Good morning. Welcome to the gathering place here in Simi Valley. So glad that you could join us this morning on the broadcast. That's some of our friends. Um, you know, I, I, I do try to read to the, the comments of some of the Facebooks and stuff. And, you know, some of our friends that can't be here, you know, Juliana, and we, we miss you, we miss your family, Dana, and um, uh, of course, Nora, we miss you. Um, and uh, we feel your pain in Florida. <laughs> and we, we love the Schmuckers um, and all their family. We miss you guys a lot. You know, Aaron, Ashley, and, and all you guys, we miss you and we love you. And uh, uh, I know Jason, we almost got out here last month, but uh, you will get out here again soon. So we look forward to seeing you. And, and for those of you, I didn't, of course, can't mention every name, but I just wanted to mention a couple names and say, we love you and appreciate you. And um, at home, if you're looking at the title on this, it says, the greatest chapter in the Bible, Romans 8. It is the greatest chapter in the Bible. And you say, what about Ephesians 1? Well, Ephesians 1 is pretty close. But I'm going to say that Romans 8 might be the greatest chapter in the Bible. Now, that's my opinion and, and God's opinion. But, you know, <laughs> if you have a different opinion, that's okay. And for those of you that are here and you're looking up on the board, it says, Romans 8, why are you still condemning yourself? Which is a good question. That would be a secondary title or subtitle, because it's very powerful. It was interesting, on Wednesday night, as we were in our prayer time, I had, um, I got here really early Wednesday, did a lot of prayer, and I did a, really created a lot of notes, because I, I felt the Spirit wanted me to do some teaching on Romans 8, and I thought, okay, so I really put a lot of, put a lot of notes and a lot of things and made sure we had it on, on this board as well. And then as we were praying, the Spirit just changed me. Even though I knew He was leading me to Romans 8 throughout the day, He changed me. So we did a completely different message on Wednesday night, which was, I thought was amazing. And yeah, and, and, then, um, and then I just said, well, this must be for another time, and God knows I may not have the time. And so he knew what my schedule would be yesterday, um, but the notes were all there, and I just had to pray over them to make them fresh within me, because um, I love Romans 8. <clears throat> so yesterday I had to help, I helped, help do some moving, couches and stuff like that. And then um, after that, I met with uh, my daughters, and my granddaughter it was her birthday yesterday, turned five years old. Um, so we spent a little time together, and then um, I had to go to two football games. You know, one was a peewee football game around 4 o'clock. It was my grandson. And then um, it was a homecoming at Kaylee's school, which she's the head cheerleader, so I had to be there for that. And the football game wasn't bad, but it was, you know, we go there for Kaylee. So by the time I got home, it was pretty late, and I just said, Lord, I thank you that Wednesday you gave me the message for Saturday. So God's good that way and say, why are you telling us that, Bob? Because that's how he does things with you. That he prepares you for things and then you don't know why and then down the road you'll find out why. I can remember times it would, something would happen, I'd get a, a check in the mail or get a rebate or something and have an extra couple thousand dollars. Go, oh, yay, you know. And then some bill would come in. And I go, doggone it. I get so mad. It's like, doggone it. I just got this money and now it's gone. What I didn't realize was God was giving me the money because he knew I was going to need it. So he's giving it to me in advance. And so now when something like that happens, I don't get upset about it. I just say, thank you, Lord, for taking care of this in advance. It's one of the ways of the Spirit. Anyways, in Romans 8, as I was driving down today and I was praying, um, and, and it was interesting, I was rerouted to the 101. There was a little bit, a little bit of a backup somewhere on the five. And as I was driving the 101, I felt the Spirit saying, I wanted you to drive this way today so that you could pray over this section of like Hollywood and, and these areas. And then he started to remind me of the meetings that we did in Fairfax High with Kim Clement and all the times we were driving down to Hollywood, you know, night after night. Remember those times, Sharon, and how rough that was? Tom, I know you were ushering there and everything. It was a hassle, the highest order, I have to be honest. 
because we were going night after night after night. And a lot of the nights, we would just worship the whole time. Now, <clears throat> the problem with worshiping the whole time is a lot of people don't like to worship. So our crowds went from full to real slim because they were all coming for the prophetic words. They didn't understand the prophetic position that God was establishing in that territory, that he wanted to establish an altar in that territory. And God was reminding me of that as I was driving through the Hollywood area today and just praying in the spirit over it and said, I want you to refresh this with your prayers right now. I want you to refresh the altar and just refresh that. It's interesting how God leads our lives in so many ways and we're sometimes just unaware. And then later we'll go, oh, I didn't realize that God was just doing that. So as I was driving down and all these things are happening, I was actually listening to um, a Kevin Zadai. And I don't, I don't like to always listen to messages when I'm getting ready to preach because I don't want to be influenced by them. But I, I felt impressed to listen to this. And um, he, he made a statement that I thought was really good that I would add in today. He said, he said Romans 8 is his template for life. And I thought, I was ready to teach this Wednesday night, but God had it set for today. So if you're here today or you're watching, there's no accidents that God wants to give you a template. And Romans 8 is that template. Now, with all the notes I have, there's no way we could finish this today. But we'll do the best we can. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to inspire you to let me be perfectly honest, to memorize Romans chapter 8. And it's just one chapter. It's not, I'm not saying go memorize the whole Bible or even a book of the Bible. But at some point, I think it's good if you either read it through every day for a month or, or even memorized it. I don't, think, I don't think it would hurt you. So let's start out. And we're going to start out with the King James. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Now, nobody actually believes that, but it's actually, it's actually in the Bible. It's the truth. We all feel condemned all the time. We're always trying to please God and say, God, what if I do this? What if I, we're always making deals with God. What if I do this? What do I, when you're making deals with God, it's because you feel condemnation. Why do I feel that, Bob? Because you live in a body that's condemned. Otherwise, your body would never age. Let's, let's, let, me, let me restate that. Your body would never die. We call it age, but God's really old. And he looks great. He's not like an old guy with a white beard. <clears throat> there is therefore now, not going to be now, no condemnation, nothing to condemn you. You're not condemned to hell. To them which are in Christ Jesus. And that answers, listen, that should answer every salvation question right there. Once you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. You're not condemned to hell. But what if I go out and I commit this certain sin? You're not condemned to hell. Because you're in Christ Jesus. Unless somebody is mature, a very mature Christian, and then they openly deny Christ. I didn't like to let those words come out of my mouth. They could, that is a sin unto death. They could do that. Baby Christians can't do that. Had to be somebody like me. Bob, you're putting yourself in a high place. I'd put you, but then, you know, then I'd have to bring you up here and put you in front of the camera. And I don't have time for that. So if you're, if you're reading the King James, which we have here, you notice that in, in the much smaller places, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The amazing thing about that is that was never in the, that was never in the Greek. That's not part of your Bible but it's in the King James. Why did they put that there? Well, they put it from verse four. Now it fits in verse four, but it does not fit in verse one. And, and uh, we'll look at it from some other translations. And if you say, Bob, what's the most accurate translation? I've always said this. Generally, scholars believe that the New American Standard is probably the most accurate translation. The, um, the Passion Translation brings some of the best insight and the Amplified Translation just amplifies everything, which helps you 
to understand, it's not easy to read a bunch of chapters. If you're reading a bunch of chapters, the Amplified can be a little bit rough. Uh, so can the King James, for that matter. So the next verse is the Amplified translation. There, therefore, there is now no condemnation, no adjudging guilty of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus. I like that, don't you? The Passion Translation says, so now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. So who's the accusing voice that comes to you daily? What's the accusing voice that comes to you daily? Or if you, let's say, let's say you make a mistake on your job and your boss says, wow, that was a really stupid mistake. What do you feel? You feel condemnation. But then that translates into other parts of your life. But there's no condemnation. So if you make the mistake of something, you go, oops, sorry, I made a mistake. And there's no, there's no reason to have guilt over it. And anybody that tries to put guilt on you, you don't let them. It's like, no, it was a mistake. It was an honest mistake. Sorry. And you move on. But some people, they want you to feel condemnation. Because they feel so much condemnation, they want company. That's really true. People in condemnation want company. But you're not their company. The New International Version says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. New living. So now there is no condemnation for those belong, who belong to Christ Jesus. Bob, why are you, you, know, why are you reading all these? Because I, I want to kind of like, I want to like beat you with it. <laughs> until you're like, I cannot be condemned. The English Standard Version says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Everybody say, in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Almost everything in the New Testament that has anything to do with a privilege or a promise is in Christ Jesus. It means you're one with him. So when you go to the Father, and when it says you go to the Father and ask in his name, you're actually in him. It's actually, he, he's actually the one asking. Now, the New American Standard says, therefore... There is now no condemnation for or at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you see a couple of other that are the same. They're, they're different years of the New American Standard, but they're essentially the same. And we'd already read the Amplified, the Holman translation. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. So it doesn't exist for you. The thing is, that's something you actually have to remember every day. Like every day you have to remember there's no condemnation because there's somebody that's going to make you feel condemnation. And sometimes the voice is your own soul. Like you deserve this. <laughs> the contemporary English version says, if you belong to Christ Jesus, you won't be punished. I like that. The good news, a little more modern, not always the most accurate, but it's still good. There is no condemnation for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. Can I read these last two? I know we read a lot of them. God's Word translation. So those who are believers in Christ Jesus can no longer be condemned. I really like that. You can no longer be condemned. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be corrected. But just because you're corrected doesn't mean you have to be condemned. If I correct somebody, I'm not trying to condemn them. And listen, I get corrected every day. Sometimes by God, just sometimes by experience. So, listen, when you, when you do something, any kind of activity, no matter what it is, and you get better at it, you're correcting. You know, when I was a kid and I was doing martial arts, the instructors would correct you. What for? To make sure you're doing it right. Uh, so it wasn't, there's no reason to be condemned, but you're correcting. So correction is not condemnation. God corrects those who he loves, but he's not condemning you when he's correcting you. He's just showing you a better way to do it. 
New English Bible. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's all of them. Now we go to verse 2. So if you started every day with, I have no condemnation, that's a good way to start. And when you look at your life and you say, well, I I thought my life was going to be this, this, and this, but it's this, this, and this, there's no condemnation. Your life never goes in an exact path like you think it would because it's life. In the movie Tombstone, it's so funny they had Doc Holliday being faster than Wyatt Earp. Doc Holliday was in such bad shape, he drew a gun once in a bar and fired six shots, didn't even hit the guy he was aiming at. Wyatt Earp was so quick, they say you could barely see his hands move. So that movie was not accurate in that way, but I really did like the scene where Wyatt Earp is at the bedside of Doc Holliday, and Wyatt's talking about having a normal life, and he said, Wyatt, there's no normal life. There's just life. And that's the thing is, we have, we have expectations, and when the expectations aren't met, you know, we, we have a problem. We condemn ourselves, and we think, what have I done wrong? What's wrong with me? Is that right? And so, unjust expectations are wrong. So when we hear preaching, we become inspired about what is possible. But between what is possible, let's go here. So here we are, young and happy, and we have this dream of what we see, what's possible. But we think we're going to get it right here, but it may be way over here. There's a big head there. That's not going to work. So here we are over here. It doesn't happen the way we think. It's not, it comes to pass differently than we think. And when it happens, we know things that we had no idea right here what we were thinking. We just knew that, oh, that's possible, but we had no way of knowing what it actually was. So it's a, it's a journey from here, from, from just having this dream from here to manifesting something. Now in Romans 8, verse 2, it says this. It says, for the law. Everybody say law. Well, what's the law? Well, it's, it's something that you, it dictates how things operate. You know, like, like we all know that the law is that you don't run red lights. If you run a red light, you can cause an accident. That's the worst thing that can happen. But if you run a red light and there's nobody there, you know, unless there's a policeman there, you'll get away with it, but you've broken the law. But if there's a policeman there, you're guilty and you'll get a ticket, which is better than getting in an accident. So a law is something that must be adhered to. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So there's a law that's in Christ Jesus, and where are you? You're in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we know that we're in Christ Jesus There's a law in Christ Jesus, and it's the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, which, by the way, is why we don't have to be afraid of sickness and disease. Now, I'm saying that in theory, because if somebody who doesn't have actual faith in that goes out and tries to prove it, and they only have the theory, they're going to get sick. But if you're beyond the theory, there is a spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus that repels sickness and disease. Now, if you eat candy every day, 
and cake for 30 days. And all of a sudden, your nose is running and you're sneezing. You're not actually sick. Your body is expelling the poison. So a lot of people, they get, they get colds. They say, oh, I, I got a cold. No, you didn't. Your body just over a period of time is expelling the poisons and the toxins. And not necessarily that you even tried to put them in your body, but you know, just because you're drinking water from plastic bottles and everything else, there are toxins. So sometimes your body's going to start to expel that stuff. And that's not necessarily sickness or being sick. But there are sicknesses, there are diseases. Dis-ease means you're not at ease. So there are sicknesses, there are diseases. But the law of the spirit of life will expel them. Now, I know everybody's heard this a thousand times, the John G. Lake story. How when he was working in Africa, when they had the bubonic plague and the doctors and the scientists came from England to help out. And um, they said to Lake, they said, because he was walking among them, he was burying them, he was doing everything, sometimes raising them from the dead. And they said, how is it that you have not contracted this plague? And he said, Romans 8, 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So, so you have to understand, he understood what the law of the spirit of life was experientially. He understood the theory of it, but he also was walking in, in the understanding of it experientially. So they took the bubonic plague, as you know. They put it under a slide. He had him take a fresh slide. They put the plague. They looked at the slide. He then took the slide, put it in his hand, held it in his hand, put it back under the microscope, and the plague was dead. What happened? The law of the spirit of life killed it. So if the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is in you, and you're not eating Skittles and cake. I say Skittles because I got all the grandkids and my niece's kids Skittles at the game last night. <laughs> well, are you trying to make them sick? No, that's her parents' job to feed them, right? <laughs> my job's to give them the fun stuff. So the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. So let's do this. Here's Adam. He's never going to die. He's never going to die. But sin comes in. Now, he doesn't physically die for over 900 years, 930 years. But sin slowly crept into his being until his body could no longer sustain his spirit. It's called death. So sin brings death. Sickness and disease are the in-betweens of sin and death. So you could be the most wonderful Christian in the world and a sickness could attack you. It has nothing to do with you or your character or who you are or how you treat people. Now, sometimes if you're a very unforgiving person, you do open a door for sickness. People who have unforgiveness, they're very much in danger of, of opening doors for sickness. So, you know, if somebody does something to you, just pray through it. If it's something that really hurts you, pray through it until you can forgive them. I said, in Jesus' name, I forgive them. Yeah, but then you still think about them day and night and you hate them. <laughs> so you need to, sometimes you need to pray through because you don't want that unforgiveness in your heart because it leads to sickness and disease. Yes. So finally, it killed Adam. So then you have Jesus. He's called the second Adam. And he is just like the first Adam. He's never going to die. But he became sin. He didn't sin. He became sin to destroy it. See that? So now, if you can destroy sin, then 
you can destroy death or sickness. Now, what does it say in the Bible? It says the last enemy that will be put underfoot is what? Death. death. So that means somewhere in the body of Christ, some, at some point in time, in the body of Christ, there's going to be such tremendous revelation that the believers will begin to overcome not just sickness and disease, but death. But when will that come? I don't know. It could come right now. We know that the average lifespan now is becoming greater and greater. People are living longer and longer. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is releasing something on the earth. He's releasing expand, like, like expanded lifespans. It's been released on the earth. And so it's being picked up by both believers and unbelievers. Because listen, God doesn't hate the unbelievers. He loves them. He's not trying to keep good things from them. And so that expanded lifespan is being released into the earth. And whoever accepts it will walk in it. Now you can tell by the way some people talk, they're not going to live long. Because their conversation is death. I had a, we used to call her Aunt Molly. She was really my dad's aunt. She lived to 99. She was spry to 99. She had perfect memory and recall. All the way up to 99, it was, she took a spill or something, and it was the last, just the last few months that she deteriorated, and she, she passed away. Now, she was not some kind of a hardcore Christian. But she had, she had certain principles that she had developed. She never, she never ate very much at a sitting. She always ate very light. And she always did a lot of reading and thinking, meditating. Like, like she, she could tell you almost anything about history. And she, her exercise was, well, in Ireland, they walk a lot in Ireland because that country wasn't built for cars. Really until recently, I think, I think well, it's been a while since I've been there, but when I was back there probably in my mid-30s, and we rented a car because my uncle did not have a car. Because if you need, you know, some meat, you go over to the butcher shop. You need some bread, you go over to the bakery. And when I say bread, that's, that's a foreign thing. You don't really know what that is because you live in America. But if you lived in another country and you ate it, you say, oh, that's what bread actually is. <laughs> what am I eating over there? It's a good question. What are we eating here? But she had, a, she had a certain rules, you know, certain rules. So I believe that the Holy Spirit is, is releasing mindsets, understanding, things where we have better understanding of health, but also spiritual comprehension so that we begin to speak words that don't give way to death. Now, I'm going to say this to you. I say this with all honesty and in a completely honest, sincere heart. When I say to you, I never, ever, 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 ever think about dying. It's never crossed my mind. Like even the, de even the demons know not to try it. It just never crosses my mind. I don't think about it. I remember I got this piece of weight equipment just, you know, not too long ago because I'd sold all my other stuff when we, we moved. And um, my son goes, and daddy goes, that's a healthy investment. I said, well, the gyms are closed and, you know, they'll be open and closed. And I said, I know it's an investment. I go, but I said, this thing is great. I'll have this for 30 years. This will, this will work for 30 years. And when I said that, I didn't even think at the, at the moment, like from the time I said, I go, I'll be in my nineties in 30 years. What were you thinking? Well, I was thinking I'll still be using this in 30 years and I will. Well, that's a mindset. Where did you get that mindset? I don't know. It seems like it came from God. It's not like it's, it's not Bob just being positive. I'm going to be positive. No, there's a spirit. There's a spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus that overwhelms the mindset of death. Let me read to you. Amplified translation. 
For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, I like the way that's worded, has freed me from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> well, see, that's, that's just a translation. It's freed me from the law of sin and death. If I'm freed from the law of sin, shouldn't I also be freed from the law of death? But you are not allowed to think that way in the church. No, it's appointed unto every man wants to die, then the judgment. Yeah, but it doesn't say when you're going to die. I mean, I realize that our bodies, I realize that we have to have glorified bodies at some point. And listen, you could be 20 and the Lord could say, oh, your work's done, come home. I mean, that's, that's a possibility. But to me, until the Lord says it's time to come home, you should never ever, ever think about dying. The Passion Translation says, for the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin, <clears throat> from the law of sin and death. So now you could say, well, Bob, that, you know, that just means, um, you know, that you're going to go to heaven when you die. No, it's, it means he freed us from sin and death. But the last enemy to put on our foot is death. Let's see if we can do that. So let me read to you from Romans, Romans 7, verse 5. Everybody still with me? Or is, do I need to tell some bad stories or is this too much scripture? <clears throat> Romans 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Pretty clear. But now we are delivered. From the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So, one of the keys to walking in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that we have to separate ourselves from the law of the old covenant. And that doesn't mean that we say that it was bad or it was, no, it was good because God gave it, but we have to separate ourselves from the law of the old covenant and learn to walk in the newness of the Spirit, and that's in the walking with the Spirit, but also walking by your Spirit. <clears throat> the day you were born again, life came into your Spirit, <clears throat> and you possessed something that you never had all your life, unless you were born again when you were very young. You had a life-giving Spirit in you, infused with the DNA of Christ and the Holy Spirit. So now we have something different to live by. Now here's the thing. As Christians, we look at our outside circumstances and say, well, <clears throat> I must not be following the Spirit. I'm in this menial position or I'm, I'm just doing whatever. I like that. I like what God did to Kevin Zadai. I do really like that. For like 30 or 40 years. He literally, he literally was good enough to be a fighter pilot and was accepted. And God told him not to do it, but to go and be a flight attendant on Southwest. <laughs> and he did it for years and years and years. Why? Because when you're dealing with people, Listen, every job I had almost before I became a pastor, I was working with people. When I was, I, I, some of you don't remember this, but there used to be, a, the way we used to get numbers for phone calls was called 411. Yeah. Now, if you're young and you have a cell phone, you don't remember that. But back in the day, you need a number, if you didn't have a phone book with you, you call 411 and they'd say, what city, please? Well, I went to get a job at the phone company and they said, well, you have to work 411 for a year. I said, okay. So I was one of those people saying, what city, please? You know what I found out? I found out there are a lot of really crazy people in the world. <laughs> like this is, before, this is before the social media. You're just, you're just getting everybody calling in and you're getting them all. So you're kind of, so they can't see you. You don't know what their number is. And, and so people just, they feel free to say whatever. And you just saw how crazy people were. I remember there was like a thing came into me. Oh my God, there's this many crazy people out there that I'm unaware of. And I knew I was a little bit crazy myself. And I was like, 
This is really bad. <clears throat> but when you're born again, you have a life-giving spirit. And so I was learning to deal with all those people. I worked at, uh, I worked at Shaky. So you're dealing with dissatisfied customers or customer. You know, there's always something wrong. I didn't get enough jalapenos on my pizza. <laughs> Take the bucket, you know. Until I worked at Shakey's, I didn't even know there were jalapeno pizzas. <clears throat> also, I learned, you know, that they tell you the customer's right. So you can't sit there and say, you can't sit and argue with them and get mad at them. And so, you, so you're doing a Proverbs 15.1, you don't even know it. You know, soft answer turns away wrath. I'll say he worked in the airlines all those years. Why? Learned to deal with people. Learned to deal with demons in different situations coming all the time. So whatever situation you're in, you don't know what God's preparing you for. But you do know this. You have a life-giving spirit living within you that's leading you. And just because your out outward circumstances are not what maybe you think they should be, it doesn't mean that you're not being led by a life-giving spirit. That the Holy Spirit is moving through your life-giving spirit and leading you. 2 Corinthians 3 says this. L listen, how many think that Paul followed the Holy Ghost? Yeah. So you think that when he was there, there a day and a night in the deep, you think he was following the Holy Ghost? <laughs> yeah. well, maybe not that time, but maybe he missed it. Maybe. But Paul had, I mean, Paul had a lot of adverse circumstances that came against him, but he was following the, he was following the Holy Spirit. So you will have adverse circumstances that hit you in your life, even when you're following the Holy Spirit, even when you've followed him to the T. As a matter of fact, sometimes it happens because you followed him. Because he's putting you in the midst of a situation, one that you might normally just avoid. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, it says, Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. I mean, the Holy Spirit gives life, but the, you know, going back, doing things legalistically. Do you know that most people are not prophetic because they're legalistic? If, if somebody has cancer and you go to pray for them, what do you do? In the name of Jesus, I take authority over the cancer. Well, that's, but that's set. But you don't have any faith that the cancer is going to be healed when you pray that way. But that's what you were taught. Hey, pray that way. Well, as a whole, you're not doing anything wrong, but you're not getting rid of the cancer either. Why not? Because you're not following the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? Are you praying by the Spirit? Now, it may be that you'll say, I rebuke this cancer or whatever, but are you following the Holy Spirit in what you're doing? Well, that's the difference. We become legalistic and we literally have lost the movement of the gifts of the Spirit in everyday life or praying for individuals because we're not following the Holy Spirit. If somebody said, oh, I'm in a situation, you know, would you pray about it? And at the time, you know, I said, they're thinking like you go home and pray. You go, sure. And you just take their hand and say, let's pray. <laughs> you know? And then what do you do? Well, you don't just give them the standard, substandard prayer. You follow the Holy Spirit. All right. I see that one over well. So it says, the ministration of, uh, says, um, if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now, I know that we've thought about this here before, but in the past I hadn't thought about it, how that, you know, Jesus was greater than Moses, but yet the people couldn't even look at Moses. But they could look at Jesus he was much greater than Moses. 
He created Moses. But people couldn't look at Moses because the glory that was on Moses was not coming from the born again spirit of Moses because his spirit wasn't born again. So it was on his outward man and his soul. I'm sure his spirit was affected as well. Don't get me wrong. But it was therefore shining from the outside. So, so when people looked at it, they felt condemnation. It wasn't like they're going, oh, it's so bright. Let me get sunglasses or, you know, no. It was, it was a, they felt like the righteousness of God was coming off it and they felt everything that was wrong within them, they felt it. Everything that came from Adam that was wrong within them, they felt that and they could not look on that glory. But because Jesus came without condemnation and his glory was within, people could look at him without being condemned and still be partakers of the glory that was on him. Are you with me? So what do we as Christians do? You know, I mean, this is, when, when, if you tell somebody you're a Christian, a lot of times, what do they do? Like, oh, they don't want to talk to you because they think you're going to judge them. Because Christians for so many years have, well, this is a sin and this is a sin and this is a sin. And it may be well a sin. But when, when you meet somebody, you're not there judging them. When you tell somebody about Jesus, it's not to judge them. They're already judging themselves. They're under judgment. They know they feel the judgment. Why do you think they're doing alcohol? Why do you think they're doing all the pills? Which is very worrisome these days because of the Chinese fentanyl that's coming down through Mexico and poisoning our children. I mean, if I'd have been alive today, I'd have probably been dead because, you know, you go to parties when you're young, you try something. These kids try something and they're, they're dying now. It's a dangerous thing. So anyways, go to verse eight. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation, everybody say condemnation. So what was verse one? that we read through multiple translation. There is therefore now no what? So there's no condemnation. But the funny thing is that the ministry of condemnation actually comes through the law. So an unbeliever who's never read the Bible actually has less condemnation than a Christian who's read the Bible or somebody who's read the Bible but doesn't understand the New Testament, the New Covenant. They could actually have more condemnation than somebody who's not a Christian. The ministration of condemnation be glory. Much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Well, what's the ministration of righteousness? It comes from your spirit, your born again nature. Okay. All right, let's move on. I know I put it up to, to Romans 8, but I'm going to read to you out of Galatians 5. Are you still with me? Yes. Okay. So in Galatians 5, verse 16, he said, This I say then, walk in the spirit. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If that's what's made me free, then this advice here, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh or you won't walk in the old way of the flesh. As we go down in Romans 8, going down toward the ninth verse, you see the flesh are those who are not saved. So walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh or you won't walk after your old nature. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, a lot of people believe that Romans 7, Paul was talking about not being born again, the flesh and the spirit, the spirit being born again, the flesh is not born again. But if you, let, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. So if I'm led by the spirit, I'm not under the law, but if I... I'm not led by the Spirit, what happens? I have a tendency to go back to legalistic, a, to a system of serving God. Like a daily system. Like we're creatures of habit, so we want to have our daily habits, but God is so expansive that even when you say good morning to him, it could be different every day. There's such prophetic... You know, we used to do a, we used to have a, a group in the mornings 
And you have to understand, I'm not really a morning person. I don't like getting up real early. <laughs> but we would get up every day at 5 o'clock, and I would text. There were 15 different people. I would text every one of them. And they were all pray with me from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And every morning I would get up, I, I, would get, I would be groggy, and the Spirit would put something within me instantly in the morning. And I would text that to every one of the group. And he gave you, before I could even think, the revelation would just hit me. And because I wasn't thinking, I wasn't messing it up. It was just, it was like, oh, that's the revelation. So I would just text that, and we would, we would pray along that line every day. We did this for quite a while. It was amazing some of the miracles and the things that would happen. And in those texts, sometimes people would text in prayer requests. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even pray. I would literally text back the answer like a prophetic word, and they would be healed, or, or it would be a word to this is the, the word to the dilemma. It was like I was speaking, but it was a written word. You can't do that, Bob. Well, the Bible's a written word. Why couldn't we do it? Because you're not writing the Bible. I wasn't writing the Bible. I was just giving somebody a word from God. So if I'm led of the Spirit, I'm not under the law, but if I'm under the law, I'm under condemnation. And I'm not living by the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. Therefore, sickness can take a place in my body through legalism. It's really quiet in this Baptist church. <laughs> All right, I better read some more scripture. We're almost, we're probably, we're probably not going to get very far today. For what the law could not do and that it was weak. But didn't God give the law? Weak through the flesh. So the law in itself wasn't weak, but it was weak through the flesh. So I cannot depend on the law to help me because the flesh of men, the law is for the soul and the outward man. Just like the glory that was on Moses, they couldn't look on it because it's on the outward man. That's how the law is. Now, when you're raising up kids, a lot of times what we do is we have to give them strict guidelines. But what if we started teaching our kids to be led of the Spirit? Now, I'm not saying that you wouldn't have to still give them some guidelines because they're, they're, you know, they're kids, you know. No, don't put the fork into the socket. You know, Kristen was our busiest child, and she never stopped. And I remember one day she did. She found a piece of metal somewhere and stuck it in a socket. So kids will do that kind of stuff. So you have to have, you have, to have some guidelines, but at some point, you're not every day saying, don't stick the fork in the socket. You know, they, they kind of figure certain things out. So we should be training our kids up to walk in the Spirit. So the law couldn't do it because it was weak through our flesh. So God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, if you just read that straight out in the King James, it's not really clear. So I'm going to actually... I'm going to actually read down to the, the... Go down to the Passion Translation. And it says this, for God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. And it's still limited by the weakness of human nature. Any condemnation you feel is human nature. If Satan or any kind of a demon tries to speak to you, it's through the soul. Oh, a soothsayer read my mind. No, no, they, they read... They read the thoughts that a demon spoke to you. So it was there. They, they, they don't read your spirit. It's all soul games. This is how the enemy operates. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God sent us his son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity. I like that. God clothed himself with humanity. God's son 
gave his body to be the sin offering. See, if you just read it in the King James, it's like, oh, it's, his sin was condemned in my flesh. No, no, no. It was condemned in his flesh. He became the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So if you do something really stupid that annoys me, I forgive you. Why? Because there's no condemnation. If I'm not condemned, why would I condemn you? That doesn't mean if you fall down and throw up on my shoes, I'm going to be happy about it. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> there is certain etiquette to life. But if somebody does something that annoys you and they don't know that it annoys you because you haven't told them yet, and then you're really upset with them, there's no condemnation. Let it go. And then maybe say to them, you know, this really annoys me. And then when you think about it, you go, oh, my God, I do exactly the same thing. A lot of times the things that people do that annoy you is the things that you do. You're annoyed by the things that you do. And so you're annoyed when somebody else does the very same thing you do. Think of Jojo Bidonovich. I'm getting my third booster. <laughs> Where's my mask? I gotta wear a mask. I only had three boosters. <laughs> Don't make fun, Bob. No, no, listen. We gotta have a little fun. <laughs> it's like, really? What are, you, what are you wearing the mask for? Compliance. You must comply. You must comply. You will comply to this shot. You will comply to these mats. You must comply. That's what it is. That's why you have stadiums full of college students at college games crying out, F Joe Biden. <laughs> well, that's not very nice. It's not, but it's truth. They're saying, they're saying, no, this, this, this guy's out of his mind. And these ways are crazy. But their, their submission to slavery, listen, you have to understand something. Slavery was rampant the world, over the whole world, till Christ came. And Paul even had to deal with certain things with slavery in the early church, which people in the South misunderstood those things. And they believed that God was on their side with slavery. In the early Americas, there was all kinds of slavery, but it wasn't just black slavery. It was a lot of white slavery. But in all slavery, black or white, you worked for a certain amount of time and then you would have freedom. But then some wicked thing came along and they stopped freeing the blacks. But there was indentured uh, servants coming from Europe all the time. That's how they paid their way. Slavery has been on the earth because it was part of sin, men ruling over the souls of other men is a wicked thing. America is the first nation that ever embraced freedom for the individual. On the founding fathers, they tried not to have it in there, but they would not have got the southern states and they would not have won the war against Britain. So then we ended up fighting another war much more severe over that very thing. And we're fighting a war over it now, but it's a different kind of slavery. It's a you will submit. The thing is, the American people have been submitting. Submitting to what? Unreasonable taxation? For, I mean, long before, long before the lockdowns and all kinds of things like that, unrealistic and unreasonable laws... And now they're starting to make laws where if you speak out against transgender or homosexuality, they're going to make laws where you're, you're going to have consequences. You know, I remember this was, this was a couple years ago, but there's this guy, he's got a wig on, the big guy, you know. 
And he's in this store, and this guy says, uh, the guy, the, the guy is a young guy, working the store, says, uh, excuse me, sir, or something. He said, called him sir, and the, the guy started just screaming at him. How dare you call me a man? I'm a woman. You know, and he's like, sound like a woman, you know. <laughs> And this guy's over there, like, this guy's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. And, and, and like, but he's acting like this big old aggressive man, calling himself a woman. I, I would have asked him, would you mind if we do the woman test? <laughs> we'll find out if you're a man or not. If you are a man, we'll help your voice become more womanly. <laughs> it's just like, it's so silly and it's so stupid. It, it's, it's really, it's, you could say it's a form of deep mental uh, a problem, a deep mental trouble. These guys are so mentally troubled. How can you, you be a man and think you're a woman? You're not a woman. And you know that most, I mean, even though women are doing the same thing the other way, it's more men. Why? Because men are more sexually aggressive. Therefore, they're more lustful. And the whole thing about being a woman is they're just lustful. But nobody, you know, nobody addresses that. Well, you know, we've got to give people their space. And, you know, no, no. If one of my grandkids is there and I said, you know, they say, uh, oh, that man. And then somebody says, I'm not a man, I'm a woman. I'd say, no, you're a man, buddy. And my kids are going to know the truth. <laughs> I, just, I just think, I don't know why I got on that. <laughs> For some reason. It's nothing to do with the law of the spirit of life. But... Uh, okay. So we hit Romans three, uh, eight three, and maybe we'll do the fourth verse and we'll call it a day. So he says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now remember they put that in verse one, but it came here from verse four in the King James. But he's talking about, as I said if we get to verse nine, which we will not today, when he's talking about walking in the flesh and the spirit, he's talking about being born again. So the righteous law is filled in us who are not walking after the flesh or not saved, but after the spirit. When you're born again, you are no longer walking after the flesh. Oh, Bob, there's, there's, there's fleshly, fleshly Christians. No, there's, there's backslidden Christians. You know, they... they they were either they were, I don't know, I, you, just, you have to wonder, were they born again the right way? Did they actually ever accept Christ? I, I mean, you know, for some you don't know. But if they did actually accept Christ, what caused them to backslide? Because, because the spirit, with, listen, the spirit within me tends to Righteousness. My spirit tends to righteousness, not to unrighteousness. It doesn't mean my soul isn't tempted or my soul doesn't have thoughts that come there that shouldn't be there. But my spirit tends to righteousness. As long as I'm not following my soul. I'm not going to backslide. But you know, people... This happens to a lot of preachers. Some preachers, they become, become great or become famous. And they start feeling like they're God a little bit, like, like it's them. Well, that's what, <laughs> that's what happened to Lucifer. Lucifer was so beautiful and so amazing. He thought, well, why shouldn't I be equal with God? Why don't I, because he had a throne. I'll exalt my throne above his. And that's when he found out that he wasn't as great as God. Some of these preachers, 
become great, and then they start listening to their soul over their spirit. It's really simple. Well, how can we avoid that? Pray in the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues. If you pray constantly in tongues, you won't, I'm not saying you'll never be tempted, but the likelihood that you'll fall is, will be minimized greatly. I don't always say this, but I, I remember, and it's a little bit off the subject in a ways, I remember um, I was in Michigan with, with uh, Kim Clement, Charlie, Jordan, and um, the place we were staying was really booked up, usually had our own rooms. So anyways, I was sharing a room with Charlie, and then you know how you have rooms and the, the doors, the, the room next to you, they'll have doors that connect, like if you have a family or something. So Kim was in the room next to us, and we had the doors open. And um, I forget why, but Kim didn't speak that night. I spoke that night. Uh, Charlie and I were back, and we were, and, and you know, we talked to Kim some, and it was, it was pretty late, but we were kind of wired up. So the doors were open between the rooms. Um, we were watching some movie, making fun of it, or just, we would talk sometimes. We used to watch those knife shows. Like A lot of times, Charlie would stay with me when he was down here, and we'd watch the knife shows. And, hey, can you believe all these knives for $80? <laughs> But we were just talking and we would laugh at that stuff. It was like, it was hilarious. And so we were sitting and watching something and laughing and talking. And all of a sudden we just hear this, this radical speaking in tongues coming from the room next to us. It's like three in the morning. So you guys were up late. We were up late because, you know, we were still wired up from the meeting. And it's three in the morning. And uh, so I said, well, let's just help him pray it through. <laughs> So we just started praying. We just started praying strong and hard. And um, I don't know, it went on for 30, 40 minutes or whatever, and then it stopped. So the next morning, he said, uh, it was a really interesting prayer at three in the morning. <laughs> Glad I wasn't sleeping. And um, he goes, well, there's a minister. And if I said the name, you would know who it is. There's a minister who's been sleeping with prostitutes and blah, blah, blah. And there's a whole issue with his wife and everything and, and uh, came into Kim's heart. He started praying about it. And then he called him like five or six in the morning and said, if you don't do this, this, and this, he goes, this is going to come your way. And, and the guy was incensed, you know, he was incensed. How dare he call me? But Kim was a prophet. And um, that's where he did have a boldness. Like he would tell people the way the, you know, the river wound. <clears throat> And he said this, and the guy, the guy called up Matt, Matt Crouch, incensed. Incensed. How dare he call me at this time and tell me, that, tell me this is going to happen. And, and, and Matt Crouch goes, you know, Kim's a prophet. I know him pretty well. He goes, he goes if he said that, he goes, if I was you, I would do what he said. <laughs> yeah. Now, this guy... This guy had a big ministry. He was known around the world. I'm not telling you his name because I don't even know what happened to him, to be honest. I had talked to him on the phone one time for 30 minutes. He was trying to persuade me to come to our church. It was only going to cost $40,000 for us to bring him there. Some, some crazy amount. It was like, and he's telling me, he's like selling it to me like a salesman. I'm like, I'm like, is this guy still in ministry? I, you come across some of those kind of people, but if you're in the spirit, if you're in the spirit and you start getting big headed, you can have a problem. So sometimes when people are going through seasons where it feels like you're in a, a place of humility, that's because what may come, you may need to have walked in that humility for a long time so that when what comes in the future, like with King David, and I'm not saying it would be necessarily as great as King David, but something like what comes with King David, you'll be able to handle it. King David was great when he was in the field. He was great when he was still under Saul's authority, even though he was in the palace. He was great when he was in the caves running for his life. 
all the sins that David committed happened when he was king. When he was on the throne. When he had the power. That's when he committed his sins. And his sins became public information. They, you know, they... There's a lot of people, they just, they want a position of status to be loved. I don't know why I'm on this this morning. Because with Romans 8, it's really sweet. But they want a position of status just to have the position. But if you're not anointed for a position of status, and you're there. I mean, I'm, I'm really honest with God. I've been in the ministry a long time, and I'm really honest with God. Oh, my God. I will do whatever you want me to do, but I will not do anything you don't want me to do. And anything you want me to do, you're going to have to pull me and push me at the same time. And because um, I'm not doing anything outside of your will. I don't want to do anything outside of your will. Whatever it is. Yeah, I could go, I could go into big churches right now and start calling words of knowledge and things out. And the people would just be stunned. How many more nights can you do? None. (laughs) But why aren't you doing that? I don't want to do that. I want to build prayer warriors. If we could build 10 prayer warriors, they're they're worth 20 million Christians. 10 10 people who can really pray, that's worth 20 million Christians. Not just that can pray, but that will pray. How do we get on that? I feel like Kenneth Hagin. How do we get on that? (laughs) Okay, let me finish this up here. So the Passion Translation. So every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. So all the requirements are there fulfilled with Christ living in you. And we are free to live, not according to our flesh. In other words, we are free to live. We don't have to live according to the dictates of the flesh, what is pushing us to do. But by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. See, I think the Passion Translation just gives that one so much much more clarity. I'm going to read it one more time. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. Isn't that awesome? And we are free to live, not according to our flesh. So we're free. In other words, you're actually free to not have to live after your flesh. You have the power to not have to live that. But by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. I think that's all we have time for today. Did we learn anything today? So, so before I go to the, the next scriptures, we're going to take the offering in a minute, um, Soaring Saturday. But let me ask you a question. Who is possibly the most maligned man in the United States right now? No, no, no. No, he's not. His approval rating just is soaring right now. Who? Bidonovich. Kwai Chang Bidonovich. Why you call him Kwai Chang? Well, because of the China connection. You know, remember Kung Fu and Ch- Kwai Chang King? He's totally bought. Uh, he's totally bought and paid for by China and, and uh, Ukraine and Russia. So he is not anointed for the office of the presidency. He's not anointed for it. He's not called for it. He used the Senate and he used the vice presidency to make himself rich and to empower himself, never to really help the people. He's in an office he's not called for, so everything he's doing is is being destroyed. Now, that's what happens with Christians when 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 Christians don't have... a a strong enough self-esteem through Christ, they feel they have to get their self-esteem by doing something that others will accept. Now, 
There are things that God calls us to do, and we know that, and we love the things that God calls you to do, you would do for free. You do because you love to do it. It's in your heart to do it. But some people do things because they feel it propels them. That's, that's the guy sitting in the White House right now. He feels, well, in Delaware, maybe. He feels that things pr propel him. But now he's finding out when you're propelled to an office that you're not suited for, everything you do comes out wrong. Say, Bob, why doesn't he answer questions from the press? Number one, because he doesn't speak English. <laughs> Where's your mask, you know? Tell stories about corn pop. <laughs> He's not anointed for that. He's not anointed for that position. He's not anointed for that office. So he can't answer questions because he doesn't have the anointing for it, and he's confused. And then even when he does, he starts to get, if they ask him, if anybody asks him a question, how was your ice cream? And he's okay. But other than that, he starts to, that's true. Other than that, he starts to getting mad. He's not anointed for that office. Now, I, it's terrible that we have to use a man sitting in the White House to make an example of what we don't want to do as Christians with what God has called us to do to walk in what God has called us to do. I like something that happened with Edna this morning. Just at the end, I was saying a few words. And I said, you know, you could be going by a building and praying over that building. She goes, Bob, that's exactly what I'm doing. She goes, I, I get on the scooter and I start going around our complex and I'll pray over this. And I'll pray where God leads me. And why did, Bob, why did you say that? Because I don't usually say that. It was for Edna. The Holy Spirit said it for her. What is she doing? She's doing what God told her to do. If we do what God tells us to do, we're going to be good. And we can do that if we understand we're the righteousness of God in Christ and we don't need to prove ourselves to God or to each other. You don't need to prove yourself to me for me to love you. Michael Jackson, one of the, they called him the king of rock, or what was he, king of pop? He made this tragic statement. I don't think anybody on the, the planet can argue that this guy was not super talented. He was super talented. Amazing. He, he was smart. He could dance. He studied all the old dancers, like Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly. He could dance. He could sing. He could entertain. Uh, he, was, he was brilliant. I mean, he was brilliant at what he did. But you know what he said? He said, if I could just sing a little better, if I could just perform a little better, maybe the people would love me. He just wanted people to love him. But he was like, he was like the ultimate entertainer. And, but he, he couldn't, to in his own, to himself, his own expectation. He wasn't good enough to where he thought people, if he could just be a little better, people could love him. But what he didn't know was people who don't love themselves can't love you. Also, so if you're, if you're looking for your validation from other people loving you, that's the wrong way to go about it. But when you know that God loves you and that you're accepted by him, you don't have to prove yourself to yourself or anyone else you just have to obey God and walk in your sonship. Amen. Amen. All right. So today is, uh, today is Soaring Saturday. The first Saturday of the month, we take an offering for Soaring Ministries, which is my ministry. Um, I don't take a salary here from the church. We just do the offering once a month, and other people give at other times, um, or just there wouldn't be enough, but... Uh, this is the main offering that we do. And um, I'm not going to actually teach scripture on that. I'm going to do what I promised you. I'm, I'm going to continue through the Proverbs and give you scriptures. We'll continue until we hit the Proverbs 31. Um, we've just been going through it each meeting, giving 
financial scripture, and not all the financial scriptures, because that would take too long, because the proverb is full of them. But we're going to go through Proverbs. Uh, today, you're going to read Proverbs 14.4. It says this, where no oxen where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Say, Bob, that doesn't make sense today, but it does actually. But much increases by the strength of the ox. In other words, you have the strength of the ox, you can go out and plow the field that you can't plow on your own. But you got to feed the ox, you got to clean up after the ox. It's a lot of work. There's in other words, a lot more work having the ox, but the increase you get from having the ox is incredible. So what he's saying is things that take more of your time, like it, more, it might take you more time and be more hassle, but it can create great increase. You know, like somebody was telling me this morning, oh God, I've been working here and there and all these hours. And I was actually talking to Gwenny, actually not texting. I was just texting to see how she's doing because I know she's working seven days a week. And um, she's just a warrior, and she's just, she's telling me her schedule, her schedule, I go, oh my God, you are a warrior. She's working all the time. She goes, but I have to get the seed money and get, you know, get the money ready for things that she wants to do. And, and so she, she's actually following Proverbs 14.4. Now, seven days a week might be a little too much, but, but you understand she's increasing. And you know what else when you're working a lot? Guess what else you're not doing? You're not spending It's true. I should say, and when you don't go out to eat a lot, you're not spending either. <laughs> it's real easy to spend a lot. Uh, another one, and this, this is a, a little bit sweeter. Proverbs 15, 6. In the house of the righteous, everybody say, I am righteous. Is much treasure. Well, you don't have to say that. I was just saying, you're the righteous. So in the house of the righteous is much treasure. That's just a promise. But the revenues of the wicked is trouble. So you may not realize this, but you're the house of the righteous. There's much treasure. Now, in the days that this was written, you would have been considered, you here today, would have been considered extremely wealthy. And in most parts of the earth today, you would be considered very wealthy. Living here in America, because we have such great wealth. Only, I mean, in this last year, we're seeing we don't have enough workers to unload the boats. Therefore, we don't have enough goods. So we're having inflation through that. We are printing up all kinds of money. So we're having more inflation through that. We cut all the pipelines. So now gas is up a dollar and a half. So we have now, <clears throat> not only does it take you more to drive somewhere, but the guys who have the trucks that bring stuff, it costs them more to drive. So they've got to charge more. <clears throat> Who do they charge? Well, it's in the stores. That's why you pay more. So what is, what is that? That's the inflation of the wicked. That's the inflation of the wicked. It's on purpose. Keep you down. Keep you under their thumb. Keep you in slavery. Now, let me just say what I believe. I believe all of this is going to be exposed in such a way that America breaks free from the slavery and the chains, really, that have been, that have been put around our neck as a nation. Oh, no, Bob. No, Bob, we, we, you know, we're being judged, you know, for our wickedness. And listen... Inflation is, is really bad right now. 82% of Americans say they're the most thing they're most worried about is inflation. It's, it's really bad right now. How could it happen so quickly? Somebody who's not anointed is in an office he's not anointed for. And so he cuts off all the oil and pipelines, even though we don't have, we don't have alternate sources of energy yet. If we had alternate sources, that would be different, but we don't. So when you do that, everything goes up just on that one thing alone because of the cost it, it, it takes to transport goods. Even, even your own you know, personal, besides your own personal that you're paying. And then when you're just printing up money out of thin air, 3.5 trillion, it won't cost anything. Ah, 
<laughs> it's like, they're like training a parrot. You put on a stand, three, five, 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 you won't cost anything. <laughs> oh, no, it won't cost us anything. When you just print, print things up out of air, the money you have becomes less and less valuable. That, I mean, a little child, most little children, well, maybe not the education day, most children understand that much about economics. You can't just print money up out of thin air. America was, I don't know why I'm on this, but America was once on the gold standard and the money was connected to gold. That means it could only go so much one way or the other. A lot of these things are going to be exposed and broken. There's going to be a listen, there's going to be a transformation. America has sown the seeds of righteousness and giving to the nations of the world more than all the nations of the world together for decades. And I believe that we are going to reap a great blessing because we're still supposed to sow. I mean, all these people coming from Haiti, why are they coming? Because in Haiti is a hellhole. You can't make a living there because they worship 350,000 different gods. You can't make a living where, the, where Satan has the foundation. What Americans don't realize is that could happen here if God does not become the foundation. So he gave us a president who was the most Christ-friendly president. Now, some people, they don't like him. They call him racist and everything else. But they call Larry Elder a black, white supremacist. So it doesn't matter what your color is. If you're on the wrong side, you're a racist. He wasn't a racist. He just believed in America. And Kim prophesied the longer he was in the White House, the more he would become a praying man. He did more things for the church and to help the church than any present we've had in the modern era. Any present we've had in the modern era. I'm under a little bit of a prophetic thing here, Veronica. I think I'm, I'm prophesying some things that are going to be coming down the pike here pretty soon. But don't give up hope. Because the transformation of finances, the transformation of finances in America, it can turn faster, faster than the downturn that we've come into. The upturn can go. It can happen that fast. And I believe it will. And, and listen, you're going, they, they can't seem to get this $3.5 trillion bill passed. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that, that, that's bankruptcy. That's a bankruptcy bill. You can't, I mean, Joe Manchin, he knows that. You can't sign that. That's bankruptcy. We can't sustain that. Who wants to bankrupt our nation? I mean, it seems like somebody intentionally wants to bankrupt our nation. I don't believe that God is going to allow that to happen. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just telling you things I see that are political, but that God has a different plan than a lot of these politicians. All right, for those of you, I'm sorry, that are giving at home, I got on a rant. For those of you giving at home, if you go to the right of your screen, they'll tell you how to give. You just scroll down to, to Soaring Ministries. And those that are here, you've probably already done. But if you're texting, you can do it that way. And then we're going we're gonna to pray. Are you ready? I love you, Jesus. Through you, I have no condemnation. Did you feel that healing and anointing just come in the room? Did you feel that? I felt it like right, like right here, just like a healing and anointing just came in the room right here. What about this side? Well, it'll slowly flow over there. I love you, Jesus. I thank you. That you became the offering of sin, became the of sin. For, me. for me. 
that I could become you, that I could become your body, that I could become your righteousness, that I could become your holiness, that I could have your favor in the eyes of our Father, that he would look upon me and see you, even though I'm unique, he loves me as he loves you, yet he loves my uniqueness. For that, Jesus, I am so grateful and so thankful. As my high priest, I bring my tithes and offerings to you. And I'm asking you with me to present them to the Father as an offering in righteousness, as a sweet savor before his nostrils. And Heavenly Father, I humble myself by proving you in this way. I humble myself and I receive the opening of the windows of heaven that you're pouring out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. And you're rebuking the devourer for my sake. And Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to release that increased revelation of your righteousness to me, upon my household, upon my finances, into our state of California, and upon our nation. And we lift up our governor right now. Father, I pray that a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you would come upon Gavin Newsom. Father, I pray that he would be changed and transformed by your righteousness. And I take authority and dominion over all the powers of darkness that are moving and pushing him one way or the other. And I break your authority. And I send the thousand of the host of heaven to tear down every platform of the enemy that's fighting our governor and driving him in wrong directions. Tear them down. Make toast of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Ushers, you can go ahead and um, receive the offering. Who needs healing right here? You. You too. Okay. What do you need? Tendinitis. Okay. Stand up. Come here, Veronica. Come, come over close. Tendinitis, where, where, does it, where does it affect you the most? Oh, oh tinnitus, not tendinitis. Okay, come here, Audrey. name. Okay. I want you to put one hand here, and I want you, Veronica, put one hand here. Okay. Now, did you feel when the heal anointing came in? Yeah, I did. Why did it come here in this section? Because you needed it. It came for you because your father was looking down from heaven and he's looking at you and he goes, I love you so much. I need to heal you. I need to, I need to get healing to you somehow. That's the way he's thinking. You're thinking, oh, I need healing if only God would heal me. But he's thinking, how can I get healing to her? What can I do to do that? That's his heart. See? So he's doing it right now as you're standing and I'm talking. He's actually healing you and he's healing the tinnitus and he's driving it out of your body. I said, you will leave her right now. You have no right to her body. You have no right to hold her body. That's it. 
Go ahead, angels. Now let the healing anointing. For the enemy has battled you in your body. Let the healing anointing go into your body and heal those years of damage. Heal them and restore them and reset them. In the name of Jesus. <sighs> feel that? It's like a breath that came in, wasn't it? I could feel it when it came in. It feels good, huh? It's like nothing's there. I mean, something did leave. So there's two things that happen here. And I wanted, actually, I wanted you to catch this, okay? There's two things that happen. When I started praying, I sensed the unclean spirit, so it left. But then, you still weren't healed, but then it had been there for many years. Is that right? It had been there for many years? Yeah. Then, the angels had to come and heal the damage that had been done from that thing being there for many years. So the angels healed up the damage that the unclean spirit caused. So there were two things that had to happen. The unclean spirit had to go, and the angels then had to heal up. Now your father, he's like, he's like this. He's so happy. He's so happy he wanted to heal you so bad. He's so excited about it. He's so glad. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It, would, it was a torment. Do you remember the remember in the in the woman with the, um, she had an issue of blood and it said she was uh, no no I'm thinking of a different woman. There was a woman who was bent over for 18 years. She's bent over, and Jesus heals her. And he said it was a spirit. He said, should this woman be a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound low these 18 years? Daughter of Abraham means that she, had, she was a daughter of the covenant, that she had the right for healing. And he goes, does this spirit, he goes, should she be bound by this spirit, even though she had the right for healing all this time? So it was a spirit that bound her. And that's the way unclean spirits work. And then they tell you why you're not healed. Well, Hey, you don't have enough faith, or maybe you need to read this more. Maybe meditate this. You know, they'll actually give you. They'll give you things to do. Yeah. You know, to, to so that you think you don't have enough faith. Yes. But if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, mm -hmm. you'll be healed. Yes. Okay. So, so when I when I saw that healing, I just saw it kind of like sweep that front row there. It's like, ooh, who is this for? It's for you. Would you want that too? Yes, because the machine I have been using, they call it sketches. Okay. And I have, it didn't go in a lot of stress and anxiety because I wasn't able to go to sleep. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, we got one healing one. I get some more. Okay, now, I want everybody to be involved in this. I want everybody to stretch your hands out. And I'm going to ask a question. Is anybody else struggling with their sleep? Okay, if, if you're struggling with your sleep, we're going to pray to break that right now. And listen, it's a big problem in America, and people think that, like, like, like some of these great big strong men, they're like 400 pound guys, they use these machines because they're, they're so big and they have so much muscle that they have to, they have to use it. But and so people think, oh, it's only for like, for like, you know, ultimate strong men and things like big, big, great big guys. But there's a lot of really small, skinny people that have issues with that. And they're literally using breathing machines. So it's an, it's an issue that I don't know all the reasons why I think some of it's demonic. It's hitting, but I'm going to pray that we just break it. And so... When we pray for Shelly, just, you just receive the prayer. We pray for her. And if you're not, just stretch out your hand and pray with us. Okay. 
Bire kamona da rata se bre baba to hora kanda di da romba baba ta. Dam boba bre kam boba chika honda da rara kike he mobo ronda da rara ba. E mo mo re kam baba bo ho re kam baba bo ho ram baba bo ta ha rain da rara mo. Ano shakam baba ho re kahan e di tike mabo baba to mama. Father, we stand in agreement. Everybody say this with me. We stand in agreement against sleep apnea right now. I break the key root that's creating and causing people in this room to not be able to sleep. And those watching as well, I take authority over sleep apnea. And now, Father, I humbly remind you of your promise that by the stripes of Jesus, you have given healing. It is a covenant promise that I call upon right now. And I release it into this room upon Shelly and anybody else here that raised their hand. I don't know if you can tell much right now, but is your head okay? Yeah, yeah you don't have a headache? Um, it's on and off, my neck spin. Your neck spin? Uh, standing next to you, I started feeling it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but we'll get to you in just a second. So, because you were in that front row, that sleeping row. I don't know if you can tell any difference because you're not sleeping, but you can let us know. I will. But I just believe the anointing that breaks the yoke went upon you. I want everybody stretched out their hands and this the anointing that breaks the yoke. So when you go to bed tonight, I want you to actually pray this way. Now, I'm, I'm a weird person in that. Grace, 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 grace. I feel like Joe Biden sometimes. Grace, grace. You know, like, except, except I say the right thing. You know. It was worth it just for that laugh. You know. But I'm real easy to ask for grace. I'm real easy to ask God for grace. So sometimes, sometimes I ask for grace for the next morning that night. But you can ask for grace for your sleep. So when I start driving today, I ask God for grace for the drive. Now, every time that I haven't done it, the drive feels like it's two and a half hours. Every time that I do it, it feels like it's a half an hour. I I'm serious, every single time. So let's just say I don't forget to ask for grace. So when you're going to sleep, just, Father, give me grace as I sleep. Let the angels surround my bed and bring revelations to me all through the night as I'm sleeping. Let them, let them come and move in my dreams and, and bring me revelation. And so, so your body may be sleeping, but your spirit's still conscious and awake and aware. So they can minister to your spirit, which strengthens then your body. So then when you wake up, you wake up like, ooh, I feel, I feel good, you know, like, okay. I'm ready to go work out with Bob, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to, I want you to stay up here though. I want you to stay in the anointing. Okay. Stretch your hands out toward Audra and I. What happened to your neck? Uh, you have, uh, I have injuries. You've had injuries. I'm upset about that. Okay. Beverly, why don't you put your hand right on her neck? Hekocha <laughs> 
Ore mana de ane aro mara de hi alolo na de anono. I command this neck to be reset right now. Reset every vertebrae. Reset the muscles. There's such an anointing for necks right now. I, I actually, I'm drinking a little bit of that anointing for my neck. I'm drinking it in. If you're here and you say, I have a little bit of neck issues, just say, I'll just accept it right now. I receive it right now. How's that feeling, Audrey? It's good. My headache went away, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Your headache that you would admit to went away? I do that. You do that? That's okay. That feels better too, yeah. Now I knew when I was, when I, we were standing and I was close to you and I was praying, I could feel, I could feel your head. Right there. I'm not easy to I'm, I'm not easy to trick on that kind of stuff. I can tell. Okay. That's what, when when the anointing is here, you could be standing next to somebody and sense something, and you could just easily just like that, just put your hand on their shoulder, or whatever, and just because you sense something, and God's anointing will flow through you. You know, we're a body, and we fight for each other. You know, when I say things like, I'm not going to have somebody do my praying for me, I mean that, but it doesn't mean that we don't pray one for another. But when I'm saying that, I'm saying, don't do nothing and let somebody else do your praying. But if we're all praying, we can fight for each other. Yes. Now, the Holy Spirit has been really speaking to me that he, he's ready to do transformative healing in our nation. And that we can't get behind, that we actually have to start moving faster because he's going to want to start doing more, including the, the, the raising of the dead, uh, including infants, you know, little infants with diseases and stuff where people, I want people coming in here, and even if they don't come back, I want them coming in here because they heard they can be healed. And when they do, that opens it up for the Holy Spirit to call them out and Bring healing. So that's, that's something I want. Now, we had a couple of healings here this morning because I felt the anointing right here. So I'm just going with what the anointing was. And then um, if you do want prayer, though, for healing or anything else, we have other people up here that will pray for you. I would pray for you as well. But we're, I, I, I see that, Tom. But um, we have other people that will pray for you because we're going to dismiss but I did, I felt what the Holy Spirit told me. And so I'm going to dismiss you guys. Do we have all of our, our team up here right now? Yeah, come on up. And then I had one more, one more quick thing before we dismiss. Usually right there, you're fine. People would rather look at you than me. Anyway. <laughs> um, somebody said to me, they weren't able to be here today, but um, somebody said to me that they're... they're Thinking about, they asked me, could I come in maybe for an hour or so, um, one day in a week, like maybe a Tuesday? And somebody who's a leader here, they said, uh, could I come in and just, you know, and pray in here and then invite anybody to pray? I go, yeah, I've been kind of looking for that. You know, I, I've been kicking Pat about it, but he's not doing anything. <laughs> I've, yeah. That's not the first you've heard of it, Pat, but, but. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually believing that God's going to start putting it on the hearts of some of our leaders. Um, because it's a little bit hard for me to get in here during the day now. I, for a while, I would come in here on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And at first, it was just like two, three people for like weeks. But then suddenly, we had 15 people coming in here praying. Like twice a week. And we'd pray for a couple of hours. 
I'd, at the end, I would talk a little bit, teach a little bit, but basically the people were coming in to pray, and it just as, as we were here faithfully, God started drawing people in. So I think he's going to have other leaders that are going to start to pick up that slack on days that I'm not here, coming in and praying, because a house of prayer becomes a house of healing. You think about what Jesus did when he cleansed the temple. What did he, what did he do? The lame and the sick came into the temple and he healed them. That's the first thing that happens when the house of God becomes a house of prayer. You just start having healing. Like we were just, pray, we were getting ready to pray over the offering and the healing only just like slid in. It was just like, boom. Right there. And so I'm grateful you came today to be healed because what would we have done otherwise? So, yeah, bring, bring sick friends and make sure we're, you know, and, and listen, if you're bringing a sick friend, don't tell me what it is, but just say, Bob, I'm bringing somebody sick. Because I usually, when I hear that, I like to pray more. And you can even text a couple other people, hey, I'm bringing somebody that they need healing. Because somebody, if they've been under something for a long time, maybe they don't have the faith you do or they don't understand. It might take a little extra intercession to get them free. And the Bible said it's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. So somebody can have the promises, but they don't, they just can't break through, but the anointing can break them through. Amen. All right, you guys, I love you. The guy, the team's up here. If you need prayer, you're dismissed. Except Pedro, you got to come up here. I need to ask you something. And um, you're free to go.